Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Chapel. As we all know, Mr. Lee is going through a series on the five emotions that we find in Inside Out. Today, he's going to be talking on the idea of anger. I wonder, what is it that makes you angry? We're going to be walking through the school and asking people what makes them angry. Come along with us. Uh, what makes me angry is uh, when I lose at footy and when I don't do good at assessment tasks in school. That makes me really mad. Um, and sometimes when I'm uh, late to quad, that makes me angry as well. Uh, I get angry when people do things that I don't think is right. Uh, I know a lot of other people will probably say the same thing. Smallers. Mr. Smallfield. Mr. Smallfield coming late to the meeting, that makes me angry. So what makes me angry? Uh, I think when people who are in a position of privilege or power look down on those beneath them and don't help those types of people, I think that makes me angry. What makes me angry is when you go up to Victoria Street and the 562 bus isn't there and you have to walk to the station. The thing, some things that make me angry are when people don't show their working in maths uh, and won't mark their work, oh my goodness, uh, but also when uh, people are unfair and don't think about others in the things they do. I think what makes me angry is when anything feels unfair. That makes me angry. Things that make me angry, Grammarly and eToro ads, the double unskippable ads on YouTube, the last few movies of Star Wars. Okay. What makes me angry? Uh, yeah, the Washington Wizards scoreline whenever I see any games that they play. What makes me angry? Humidity in the air when I'm trying to go for a run. Too much humidity. Very annoying. And when anyone from Studies of Religion uh, in Year 11 comes more than five minutes late to class. What makes me angry is when I play a game and try to teach someone something new and they ended up beating me first try and I've been playing that game for like ages. What makes me angry? Uh, bad referees make me very angry. I already lose enough points in volleyball as it is, and the bad referees just make me lose even more points. What makes me the most angry is people being hypocrites and having hypocrisy, and people who lack common sense. Me angry. Many things make me angry. One of the things at the top of my list are selfish people. I, I get uh, just get angry with selfish people, or who just uh, can only see themselves in this world and uh, don't consider anyone else. Uh, that makes me angry and I, I, going back to what makes me frustrated as well is just general injustice. Uh, when I see injustice, it, it just frustrates me and makes me angry in the world. The things that make me angry are selfishness, bullying makes me angry, and people who hurt children. Hypocrisy makes me angry, and people who order their steak well done you know, like, if you just hate steak that much, maybe order something else besides steak. When I was in year 12, uh, I broke my right hand. Uh, I broke it punching a wall. And I was punching a wall because I was angry. It happened during tennis training. We were practicing smashes and there was this one guy, Jeff, who kept aiming his smashes at me. Now Jeff was pretty good at tennis, and so I copped it on the leg, copped it on the back, even on the neck. I looked to the coach for help, but he just laughed and said to get out of the way. So, when it was my turn at the net, and that first lob went up, I made sure to aim my smash right at Jeff. Now as it turned out, I missed him, but it was still close enough for the coach to notice what I was doing to stop practice, to tell me off for being silly, and to send me to run laps of the oval. I asked him if Jeff was also going to run laps for the smashes that he aimed at me, uh, but the coach just told me off for talking back and doubled my laps. Now, furious at this injustice, I left the court, and instead of heading to the oval, I went inside the tennis clubhouse where I tossed my racket on the floor, and without really thinking, punched the nearest wall breaking my hand. It was a stupid thing to do in the heat of the moment. And it ended up having some pretty far-reaching consequences. I had a couple of pins inserted in my hand and if I look closely, I can still see the scars for where they put them in 22 years later. I had to undergo months of rehab. I wasn't able to do any of my musical performances for my HSC nor finish my visual arts major work. 
And I had to do all my HSC exams with a scribe, even maths, which I was already pretty poor at. All because of a split second decision that I made in anger. Now in the film Inside Out, anger is exactly what you'd expect him to be, and in work clothes no less. Uh, he's the color red, he loves curse words, he yells, he throws things, and when he doesn't get his way, he blows his top. Literally, fire shoots out the top of his head whenever he's in a rage. For the most part, anger plays a fairly ancillary role to joy and sadness, but he does make one of the most important decisions in the film. Uh, when Riley is struggling with adjusting to life in a new city, anger steps in with the decision to run away from home. It's a decision made at a time when joy and sadness are lost far from headquarters and it reflects exactly the kind of semi-irrational thinking that happens when someone is angry. And what's more, when the other emotions start to think that running away might be going a little too far, they discover that, like a lot of decisions made in anger, can't easily be undone. And we all know what that's like, don't we? We all know what it's like to have said or done something in anger that we've later come to regret. I mean, that time that you lashed out with your tongue, or that time you lashed out with your fists, or that time you lashed out online. It's why of all the emotions, anger is the most dangerous, the most deadly. Now, of course, anger isn't always wrong. It's right to be angry at some things. It's right to be angry at child abuse and human trafficking and other forms of injustice. And because anger tends to generate a lot of energy and adrenaline, it actually has the potential to do a whole lot of good in this world. But let's be honest, for the most part, anger is extremely destructive. You see it in relationships marred by hostility and contempt. Uh, you see it in communities poisoned by hate. You see it in individuals weighed down by bitterness because anger doesn't just hurt those around you, it hurts you too. Uh, the writer Mark Twain once said that anger is an acid that can do more harm to the vessel in which it is stored than to anything on which it is poured. And the research backs him up. Uh, all kinds of studies show that anger is much worse on your body than any other emotion. Anger weakens your immune system, it hurts your lungs, amplifies your anxiety, and is terrible for your heart. Seriously, angry people are twice more likely to suffer from heart disease and three times more likely to suffer a heart attack. And you might be sitting there thinking, geez, thank God I'm not an angry person. But here's the scary part. Angry people almost never know that they're angry people until it's too late. Now, why is that? Well, part of it's because when we're angry, we usually feel we're in the right. Anger, you see, is a fundamentally moral emotion. It wants justice. Anger is your heart pointing the finger at something and saying, that is wrong. It's pointing the finger at someone and saying, you are wrong. The unspoken part of which is, of course, and I am right. And when you feel deeply passionately write about something, it's pretty hard to step back and say, well, maybe I'm part of the problem here. So as a result, angry people, well, they tend to be highly attuned to the faults and failures of others while simultaneously being utterly blind to their own. And it's that kind of self-righteousness that makes anger such an insidious and destructive emotion. As it says in the New Testament book of James, which we heard just a moment ago, Human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Now, it's worth noting that James calls it human anger because in the Bible, anger isn't a uniquely human emotion. In the Bible, God himself gets angry. He gets angry when he sees people oppressing one another. He gets angry when he sees people ruining the world he has made. And he gets angry when he sees people rejecting him, turning their backs to him, seeking to take his place. So when you stop to think about it, God gets angry at a lot of the things we get angry at. But there are some key differences between God's anger and our anger. See, unlike our anger, God's anger is never unaccounted for. It is never disproportionate or unpredictable, never irrational. 
And whereas we as humans are often quick to become angry, in the Bible, God is continually described as someone who is slow to anger. Contrary to the myth, he doesn't send lightning bolts down whenever we do something that he doesn't like. But instead, he is patient with us. He gives us plenty of time to change. And he even gives us his son, whose death on the cross paid the price for everything you and I have ever done or ever will do that deserves righteous anger. Not only that, but the biblical writers claim that Jesus' resurrection is proof that a day is coming when God will bring perfect justice to bear on the earth, when all wrongs will be righted, and when everything that's been broken will be put back together again. And because this day is coming, well, we too can afford to become like God, slow to anger. You see, the thing about anger is that it wants results fast. It's never content to sit idly on the bench. It demands to be satisfied with action and quickly. It wants justice, and it wants it now, right now. But when you have the assurance that not only justice, but in fact perfect justice is on the way, well, it takes the pressure off you having to secure your own form of justice, which, let's face it, will only ever be imperfect. And so rather than being quick to anger, quick to cry foul, quick to point out other people's faults and failures as though justice depended on us taking action, we can rest in the knowledge that one day God will bring perfect justice to bear on that person, that situation, or that thing. And the more that you rest in that knowledge, the more you'll realize just how much you can afford to be like God, slow to anger. You know, sometimes I think back to the time that I broke my hand and I wonder how the last few months of year 12 would have been different if I'd only taken a few deep breaths before entering that tennis clubhouse. If I'd stopped to have a cool drink on the way. Basically, if I'd just been a little slower to anger. I reckon things would have been better. Not only would I have been able to do my HSC properly, I would have saved myself and my family from a whole lot of unnecessary stress and, ironically, more anger. Today's reading pleads with us to be slow to anger. James says, be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. So the next time that you feel anger rising within you, slow down. Do all those things the experts say to do. Remove yourself from the situation. Take a deep breath and count to ten. You'll almost never go wrong by taking the time to think before you act when you're angry. Pause. and Seek to understand another point of view before giving your own. Listen before you speak. And above all, cultivate humility by remembering Jesus. Remember how he suffered for your sake. Remember that he died so that you wouldn't have to face God's anger for all your faults and failures. Remember how he endured the ultimate injustice so that you and I might have the hope of a day of perfect justice. Remember Jesus, because remembering him will produce in you the kind of character you need to overcome your anger so that your anger doesn't overcome you. Let's pray together.